All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so good evening, New School students and faculty. Um, thank you for joining us for our first lecture of the fall quarter. For those of you that I haven't met before, I'm Michael Cintron, third year undergraduate architecture student and member of the New School Lecture Series Committee. Our event this evening will begin with the lecture followed by a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to send in your questions. Uh, we will answer as many as time permits. I'm honored to introduce our special guest, Roman De Salvo. Roman is a San Diego-based sculptor and public artist. His art is characterized by an inventive use of ordinary materials and objects often involving energetic phenomena such as wind, water, fire, electricity, and audience participation. His work includes large-scale projects for public parks. Some highlighted work includes the Riparium, an expansive gateway structure for Ruoco Park in downtown San Diego, and Fountain, May, Fountain Mountain at Mission Trails Regional Park in San Diego County. I first learned about Roman's work in studio last year after having seen it displayed in local museums in San Diego. His art truly stands out in showcasing how art is integrated into architecture and design. And now, Roman, I'll turn it over to you to begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to screen share and start talking about my work and tell some stories of how I've integrated what I do with uh, the settings in which th you find the work. And uh, let me get set up for my screen share. Um, okay. How's this look, Michael? Uh, not saying it yet. Um, There we go. Just share. Okay. Yep. See it now? Okay, yes. I'll get read it. So so I'm gonna start out with a um a, a a kind of a um a quick collage to show you the range of what I do before I go into stories of sort of my career as a public artist. This is uh this is called FaceTime from 2000 at the Whitney Biennial, uh, actually a project that people could eat out of and see themselves reflected close up while they ate their meals. Um, this is called Hydrant Fire. This is a tree trunk with light bulbs where all the branches used to be. This is a alabaster little statue that I call my pride and joystick. This is um, a playground at the uh, in the city of San Jose, where I um, basically made this playground largely from the, uh, the leftover trees that had to be harvested or cut down at the site to make a way for this community center. This is one of numerous projects I've done at the uh, New Children's Museum in downtown San Diego. This one, kids ride around in these chariots that they power by pedaling with their arms and uh, got this little racetrack painted on the floor. Um, this is a uh, piece called Liquid Ballistic. It's a, a looks like a cannon, but it functions like a seesaw. And when people ride it, it pumps water like a fountain. This one's called Firewood. It's just um, it's plywood and actual firewood. And this last little thing to fill out the collage is a sculpture of made of rocks um, kind of tinker toy structure of rocks and steel rods. I call this one air boulder. So it's a big range of things that look unrelated, but throughout my career, I've been interested in energetic phenomena such as wind, water, um, fire, uh, electricity, audience participation and play figure into much of what I do. And I like the use of irony and surprise to light up the minds of my audience. So let me 
go into um, some stories of how I became a public artist and begin it with the work I was doing as a grad student at UCSD um, in the early 90s. Work such as this where um, there was a, uh, a car had backed into a post and dislodged it from the ground, left a hole there and I decided to fill the hole by planting a tree in, in place of the post. And I did, you know, this hydrant fire around that time. I did this piece called Zern Fountain, which is a little fountain that erupts from a floor drain in a public restroom at UCSD. These were the kinds of things I was doing as a grad student that were, I've, I've considered unsanctioned public art, but I thought that these were things that works like this gave me credentials for doing official sanctioned public art in the official public art world that I might have a career in that someday. So I was applying pretty zealously to public art opportunities around the country, but uh, with a portfolio made up of work similar to this, um, and including these works, just getting no, no positive results, responses from those applications. So eventually I became discouraged and uh, kind of gave up on the idea of becoming a public artist. Uh, but fortunately, a, an art gallery in town, Quint Contemporary Art, took interest in what I was doing and offered me a show. So around the time I was finishing up graduate school, I had this show at a commercial space. But the, this, um, the gallery was a, a bit of a quandary for me. Um, it presented me with like kind of an issue because I'd been doing this site specific work uh, responding to things like, you know, a post being knocked out of the, uh, the ground at the alley and, you know, putting a tree in its place. That I, the gallery is the kind of place that art galleries in general attempt to be neutral spaces, devoid of context so that artworks that presumably are self-sufficient can, can speak for themselves and there's no relationship to context in, in as much as they can, can make it that way. And so formally the gallery just didn't interest me much as a white a space of, you know, a white cube. Um, I had to think of what was, what the gallery, how it functioned to kind of think about how to respond as a site specific artist to a gallery. And so I came to the realization that galleries are kind of like showrooms or staging areas for work that ultimately ends up in the homes of people. And so really I could think of the context ultimately as the domestic space. And so I thought I would do work for that space given that I was also at the time making work for my own domestic space. Those ideas I could maybe pr present as potential for other, the, the domestic spaces of other people. So my own domestic space was kind of <clears throat> You know, I lived in an apartment and I'd had a wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpet that I disliked. I would have preferred a hardwood, a hardwood floor. So what I did was I made a hardwood carpet that I could lay down on my wall-to-wall -wall carpet to give myself some semblance of a hardwood floor. And that's what this is, is my hardwood carpet there in the foreground. I had these other things like this, this relief lamp, a, a kind of conventional table lamp that I sliced to mount on the wall like a, a relief sculpture, but also to relieve a table from the burden of having to support this kind of oversized lamp. The centerpiece of that show was this small fireplace, only about 15 inches tall. Um, excuse me, I need to take a breath here. And um, this, so, one of the things living in my apartment, I, I always had this sort of romance with the rustic fireplaces um, that you find out in cabins in the woods and the mountains and whatnot. Um, I thought I would like to make myself a, a, a good old stone fireplace someday and would have liked to have made one at my apartment, but obviously you can't just, when you're renting, go making um, stone fireplaces in your apartment. But then again, you can, I thought, hey, I'll make a small one and um, kind of explore this romance, but in miniature and kind of um, have an experience through a kind of 
it becomes more fan fantastical and vicarious, but it's real too. It burns real fire. And I um, displayed it at Quint Gallery and people really cozied up to it for real and zealously stoked the fire. They got really into it. And I basically realized that when you miniaturize something like this, it actually can enhance the romance. And uh, so that became a theme in my work over the years. I made another small fireplace. This one burns um, sterno, a blob of gelled chafing fuel in a little copper dish that I hammered out. So that one doesn't require the ventilation that the wood fired one does. This one is a small fireplace. Um, I call it the harvest hearth. It's made of manzanita burls um, and it's basically a swag lamp. It hangs on a swag chain. There's a little light bulb inside that illuminates this polished wood grain interior of the hearth. This is a small fireplace for the outdoors that has a, a table with a, um, a reflecting pool in that table, but it's also a bird bath. So I call this one spa. Some more furnishings that it um, later, uh, this is kind of mid, mid late nineties. Um, this in this ensemble, you see that that uh, poor sofa again, and I did some other things. I did a, a, a fireplace carved out of a, a lava lava boulder mounted on the wall, and uh, my home state in the area rug. That's Nevada. Um, this easy chair I made by just simply taking a steel folding chair and um, making it more sumptuous by wrapping it with this upholstered cushion. This is a, a lamp that I'm, um, I didn't make the lamp. I just uh, acquired the lamp from a thrift store, but my, my, um, my integration of a wall switch into this lamp body kind of anthropomorphizes. It. That's my gesture with this piece. Um, still with the furnishings vein in my career, um, this is in 1996, I was invited to a, to be in a exhibition in Copenhagen, Denmark, which Copenhagen that year was the cultural capital of Europe and they were putting on all kinds of exhibitions. One of which was this one, which took place at the Harbor in an exhibition architecture comprised of uh, shipping containers sometime before the shipping contain container uh, craze really took hold. The, this happened there. And I was, you know, of the mindset of thinking so much about furnishings and, and domestic decor conventions. Um, my approach to what to do with a shipping container was to think about that and to try and transform the container into a room which has some niceties that containers lack. And um, so I thought about um, what, what I could do to a corrugated metal box. Um, it would still be a shipping container, but it would have some semblance of a room by virtue of hanging a chandelier. Um, this is the chandelier I made hung from a magnet and, and little horseshoe magnets that staples kind of advertising the, the, the fastening technology employed here. And uh, the, sh the chandelier is made modularly through from twin socket adapters in that. So thinking about the modularity of containers kind of came, brought me to this kind of solution for the chandelier. And the chandelier also had to be answered on the floor. I felt like the, 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 it called for a kind of ornate carpet on the floor, which in turn called for a finishing out of the edge with some base molding, which, you know, the ridiculous amount of mitering to have to, to do to, you know, get the molding to conform to the corrugations was amusing to me. Uh, 20 years later, I had another opportunity to do a project in a metal box. This was an aluminum metal bubble box called the Streamline Mobile Gallery at the Sierra Nevada College of Art up at Lake Tahoe. And they, they um, tow this gallery space around to various locations here, that, here it's in Virginia City, Nevada. I knew I'd be doing a show in this metal box during at high elevation during the dead of winter and that it would be cold. 
And so I thought of a project that would help keep me warm. I thought I would just make a wood burning. Uh, I, the, the wood burning or pyrography, some call it, is basically, you know, drawing on wood by using hot metal tools to burn into the wood. And so I have a torch and I have this, these, these large pieces of copper to um, heat, heat the wood and burn, make smoke. It's basically a, a, a process that I thought would keep me warm, if only through the placebo effect. Um, and that I would choose imagery, which I did, this cabin interior that has had a lot of coziness to it. That was my way of kind of um, warming up the space and, and really infusing it with some conviviality, which I could, could find was really the case when people got, came into the space and um, you know during the opening, it, uh, I felt like it worked. So this brings me now to my first public art project. So, um, I'd been doing all of this work in the, sh in the, in the art world. Uh, um, galleries, art institutions were taking note of what I was doing, giving me shows. And it was furnishings based interior decor kind of ir iron ironic work. And I, uh, um, I'd given up on public art, but somehow word got out about me in the public art world. And I suddenly found myself without having to actually applied, I was a finalist on uh, being considered to, do, to work on this trolley station, um, just one stop east of San Diego State. Uh, it's the Alvarado Medical Center station um, in the San Diego trolley system. And so this is the, how the station looks now. And I was brought on board to work with architects and um, landscape architects and engineers and I brought, I came to the project with my sensibilities with furnishings and saw this wall as an opportunity to, to kind of do my thing. And so I proposed for, for example, this, this to break up the, the, this, this wall with, you know, some fireplaces like, but they weren't fireplaces. What I was proposing was a water place in this, this, this idea was to have an actual, um, little cascade of water down the back of the fireplace as a, um, as a fountain, basically a water feature fireplace or a water feature hearth. I called it a water place. Well, um, there wasn't support for that idea given just trolley stations generally don't have water features. Um, so I thought, well, let's try a fireplace to, to kind of produce the energy of a fireplace, we can use plants, uh, a real vibrant plant to kind of glow in the, in the hearth there and maybe um, flank it with the tapestry of vines and, and sconces with cypress trees. And so I was still thinking of fireplaces and you know, talking with the design team, showing them these sketches and um, getting kind of like, just not, they weren't feeling it. And so, um, eventually, you know, I was also showing them a lot of other sketches for furnishings and clusters of furnishings made of um, different, uh, you know, ironic materials that I thought would, the irony, irony at a trolley station would be fun. But it turns out that it wasn't, I wasn't getting anywhere with the design team or, or the client um, with bringing my my kind of approach to furnishings to this linear situation. This is essentially a, a rigorously functional utilitarian linear space. And I was trying to create these like living clusters um, in what is essentially a linear situation, clustering people up around furnishings or hearths. It just didn't, it fought the flow of the space. This space is designed to distribute people linearly so they can efficiently get on board and off, off, on and off the trolley and the trolley can get out of there and be on schedule. So um, I had to really rethink how, um, I had to rethink the opportunities of the site, not as a space for my expressions with my ironic kind of take on furnishings, but really think 
about the site from scratch. And so I did notice there was this, you know, the, the, the ceiling height of the space in terms of like what has to be there. There's canopies against the wall. There's lights that only go so high. There, there, there's a lot of regulation to where things have to be um, in a trolley station, like there are in so many, um, you know, other kinds of projects. So, but beyond the sort of ceiling height of the space was this long strip of wall. This is basically a traffic barrier between the freeway and the trolley station. And that presented a, a, a kind of presented like an opportunity, I thought. Um, I could think of it as a freeze and maybe write something that by the, the act of reading it would draw people along the length of the station and help distribute bodies in a way that was actually helpful to the flow of the station rather than fighting the flow. And so I came up with a, a text and it, as it evolved, it became a riddle, which is a kind of engaging, playful, problem solving kind of game text, a poem as well. And I'll read it to you now. Arteries, veins, and capillaries for autos, rain, and catenaries. All three lines are side by side, above, below, and stratified. One is numbered less than nine. Another was here at the dawn of time. The last will be here after a wait or right away if you're not too late. Look around to solve this riddle. Name all three, top, bottom, and middle. If bewildered, feel the handrail. The answer there is writ in braille. And that's the answer to the um, uh, encoded in braille on a handrail there at the trolley station. Uh, it's a three part answer. And most people, when they think about the riddle, um, they read it and they think about it, they get the um, interstate eight is one of one part of the answer. They get the trolley line as the other part of the answer. And they're a little bit mystified by the third because it's actually a hidden thing. You really need to kind of look a little beyond the station itself um, um, adjacent situations to realize that there's a creek buried underneath the station in a boxed culvert. And so this piece is actually a bit of a, a way of, I thought of memorializing the loss of a riparian environment that happened when that station and trolley line was built on top of a creek. And so uh, the third part is Alvarado Creek. So that project, my first public art, official public art project taught me about um, working with the flow when, when people are moving the audience is a moving, um, uh, you know, creature. They pass through spaces, and making work that utilizes their passage kind of harnesses their motion as a way of, as a kind of engine for unfurling a, 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 an experience. That was something I kind of felt like I discovered with Alvarado Medical Center Station that I applied to this project at. Um, it's called Crab Carillon. It's on Twenty Fifth Street. Very close to the new school of architecture um, between Golden Hill and uh, Sherman Heights over the 94 freeway. It's basically a musical um, railing that you can actuate the, these chimes as you cross the bridge and play a song that was composed by the composer Joseph Waters, um, especially for this bridge, it's a palindrome, so it makes musical sense whichever way you cross the bridge. And I, I applied that way of thinking to the vertical circulation of the um, stairwell at the Museum of Contemporary Art in downtown San Diego, the uh, kind of emergency stairwell uh, um, in their office building. Uh, you enter the, um, the stairwell at ground level and you're greeted by this ornate use of electrical conduit and bare incandescent bulbs. This is the permanent lighting of, the, of their stairwell space. Um, you take a left turn to go up to the second landing, you see this motif, only now it's doubled. At the third landing, the motif is tripled. And so there's a counting that happens as you ascend the stairs. Uh, here's at the fifth landing, you see five of them. And ultimately, it climaxes at the top floor um, where there's an expansion of the verticality of the space. You see the motif 
repeated sevenfold. And that piece is called Utility Filigree. It was uh, working with electrical conduit, um, something that I uh, had been doing for a, a few years and done a lot of work with electrical conduit. You see one of the pieces right behind me. Uh, this is another one uh, that the Museum of Contemporary Art owns. It's, uh, it's a maze. So mazes are a way I like, like riddles. I like to engage people in, in problem solving. I also like problem solving on my own as a, as a kind of deed that motivates my work. Uh, here's this one I call it for your foyer. It's in some, it's in the collector's foyer. It's a, a lighting array of electrical conduit. Um, another kind of maze I've made is, you know, using other materials. I've done mazes with, with um, trim, like architectural uh, moldings and trim boards um, on, on wall surfaces. This one is actually a screen made of I-beams uh, at a uh, high-rise hotel next to Facebook up in Menlo Park. It's kind of screens between active and passive uses in a uh, hotel kind of context. And I'm pretty pleased with this one. Thinking about, again, going back to the um, working with the flow and understanding the circulatory patterns of, of how people pass through spaces, that figured majorly into, the, into how I conceived of this work for the Caltrans District 11 headquarters in Old Town, San Diego. This is what the piece looks like as you arrive to the Caltrans campus and approach the, um, the courtyard space from the parking lot. You're greeted by these kind of organic timbers reaching out from within the courtyard space. You get into the courtyard and look, looking up, it's kind of like this, this organism um, suspended. It's, it's uh, 50 feet wide, 120 feet long, and hangs 30 feet in the air. And it wraps around the architectural elements and is, is very flowy and sinewy, sinuous. Uh, you, as you rise into the building, the various levels, you start to see how, um, that it's really got a lot of topography to it as well. And at the third floor, you look across it and it's like looking across a landscape of, of like these ribbons that go over implied hills and meander through implied valleys. And uh, it's suspended with all these plumb lines and uh, has this very landscape-like uh, feeling about it which when you rise to the higher levels and look down on it, it becomes kind of map-like and people think of the work as a literal um, map or depiction of the local freeway networks. It's not exactly, but I like, I like the way they think. It's okay with me. Um, I thought I'd take a break from the integrated work to kind of do a little, um, Show show and tell of some uh, some studio pieces. You know, I I made a model to propose this concept for Caltrans, and the making of the model was really a satisfying project in its own right. I used a bandsaw to slice to fillet these um, branches and and then join them together uh, with little splines. Made made a nice. Um, pretty satisfying model. And when I was done with the big piece, I thought I would like to work in this vein in a smaller scale, doing, doing uh, you know, artworks, discrete artworks, not, con not contextual artworks. Um, but this one's spliced together, a kind of um, bilaterally symmetrical um, design articulated by brass hinges in the middle. It can actually fold up and, um, so it's like a book matched kind of uh, branches of a loquat tree. This one is, I call it joinery blossom. You can see very well this, this spline system I used to um, fit these and glue these pieces together, the joinery. This one 
made of all of all of branches is called patch and all over kind of logic to that one. So each one of these things, when I do these branch splicing projects, I'm thinking of a different sort of pattern logic that I'm guided by. In this case, um, I first made these triangles um, by splicing together Y's forks to make triangles. And then with all these triangles, they became the kind of puzzle pieces that I had to find out how to connect to create these sort of bubbles. I call this piece, um, which you can see the details of here, uh, delta tissue because of these uh, kind of triangles, um, how they basically were the, the, uh, the DNA for the, the pattern that emerged. So now I'm going to talk about Rocco Park and but give a bit of a backstory to it um, because I had been thinking about the area of Rocco Park for a few years prior to actually becoming the artist doing work for Rocco Park. Um, sorry about the phone interruption. Um, so I I uh, I got invited to be um, didn't think that would happen. Uh, um, I got to be is you know it's, it's political times, so the the landline gets some use that ordinarily wouldn't. Um, anyway, sorry, uh, I'm a little just derailed by that, but. Uh, so what, what I was always saying, I got invited by um, Rob Quigley, a local architect that many of you know about, um, uh, kind of a local legend, great architect. And uh, he uh, asked me to be a part of a kind of a team that included him and some other local kind of thinkers about design and, and cities. Uh, there was a historian involved. The landscape architecture firm of Sasaki Associates were, were the, the lead group on this. Um, the, basically, the port was having a competition to see what to do with C, the Seaport Village area and the old police headquarters in that area around what is now Rocco Park. All of that was being considered for redevelopment and, and uh, the leader of the port, uh, the Port of San Diego, put together, uh, um, kind of ha had this idea of having this uh, kind of international competition to, to think of how to, to treat that area, re-envision it. And so that was a pretty um, stimulating experience for me to, to be involved in that, that effort. We ended up winning with our design, uh, though, you know, of course, the design was not ultimately implemented, it kind of got shelved just because it was pretty radical. Our effort was to, the basic guiding principle was to bring the water to the city and to bring the city to the water, to kind of um, make the water for the, the people in downtown San Diego. And to, you know, basically the, the waterfront in downtown San Diego has historically been the, the domain of military, um, industrial fishing, tourism, and all kinds of land uses that didn't really have much interest or draw for the, the local citizenry. And we proposed um, things to do to kind of to, um, to fix that. Um, and so bringing the water to the city as we envisioned it and would require tons of dredging and reshaping of the coastline, pretty radical things that have not happened, but the thinking of bringing the water to the city and vice versa, the city to the water was really um, central to my thinking of how to deal with Rocco Park as the artist for that site when I ultimately applied to that project. And so I was thinking a lot about this access east to west between the city and the harbor through the park wanting to basically celebrate and enhance that, that experience of that access. And, um, but I was also thinking a lot about 
the park's namesake, who, who is another architectural legend, the mid-century architect Lloyd Rocco, is um, he and his wife Ilsa Rocco left a trust for the establishment of a park somewhere in San Diego, and that's what how Rocco Park became funded. And uh, so I was really, I really became a fan of Lloyd Rocco majorly through through my research for this project by visiting many of his um, buildings and reading his writings. And I came to realize that Rocco had a way of addressing the street that was very different from the way he addressed nature and, and gardens and parks and the like. Um, he had a very inscrutable and businesslike way of addressing the street as you see here in this um, picture of the, the frontage of uh, the Interplanetary Geophysics Building at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, so this is how it looks when you enter, uh, you, you come to the front door of, the, of this building, uh, but this is how it looks at the other end. It's a completely different way of responding to views and nature and the outdoors, uh, very open, very much about framing. So there's a kind of screening and then a threshold experience that happens through his buildings that I really responded to. This is something, this is just one example with this building. There, there's many examples and uh, it really captivated me and I felt I should, I'd like to, to basically do an homage to the way Rocco's, Rocco would cite his buildings on a site, the way he would address the street versus the way he would address um, say a park or a a harbor. So my my plan called for an architecture, an ar kind of architectonic way, a business-like way of situating on the corner, addressing the city in a right angle architectonic manner um, while addressing the park in a much more organic fluid gesturing into the park with some timbers that I will show you now. This is what got built. Um, so it sits on the corner, a busy intersection of Harbor and uh, Pacific Highway. And you see the, the Harbor beyond. And uh, here at the corner, you uh, now, nowadays it's been, it's, the, the landscaping is more established, but the foundation plantings have grown almost as tall as the columns. So they help to screen and guide you to the corner entrance here of this, to, you know, this is the formal entry to the park, the gateway. And uh, entering the gateway, you kind of, your, your eye is led by these gestural timbers, a kind of inverted landscape of rivulets leading to the, the, the water. I call the piece of the riparian because um, I'm thinking of it as a house of streams and, and rivers. Uh, thinking of those, it's a metaphorical way of thinking about tying the city to the, the water. The, the streams and rivers of San Diego come to the bay, come, the, the, bay is a, the bays are, are, are natural deltas for a number of streams, rivers and, and streams. And uh, this, th that riparian system is what ties the land to the, the ocean. And uh, so that's, what I'm thinking about with this this uh, title, and but formally really trying to frame the park and celebrate the arrival to this new public space on the waterfront for the citizens of San Diego. And looking up at this uh, structure, um, just a detail to show kind of the joinery of these eucalyptus timbers that have been sliced in half and joined, um, suspended from masts that echo the harbor, the, the kind of scenery you have out in the harbor with all the boats. Looking back at the, the piece from within the courtyard, I mean, from within the park, looking back at the city at, at twilight. And this is a night shot. So at night, um, lighting from that's embedded in the hardscape up lights to the, to the, the wood and illuminates the wood from below. Um, gateways were, had been, prior to Rocco Park, had been actually of interest to in me for many years as a sculptor. I, I grew up in a town that had a, 
had a, a kind of famous gateway. Um, it does have one uh, in Reno, Nevada. And these gateway arches, gateway features, um, these, are, these are interesting um, forms to me. Um, they have interesting reasons and, and, and I like to kind of uh, answer those calls. So this, while, while the, um, the riparium, the gateway at Rocco Park wasn't um, advertised as an opportunity for a gateway, I chose to make a gateway. That was my contribution to that park. Um, I felt like the, the, the creation of new public space on the waterfront called for a gateway. And that's what I made. So, but here this project was actually explicitly calling for a gateway that was the, what, how it was advertised as a gateway project for a new public um, par linear park on a restored area of Choice Creek. Choice Creek is my local watershed in San Diego. Um, it drains La Mesa and parts of La Mesa, Lemon Grove, Southeast of San Diego and uh, City Heights all down to the 32nd Street Naval Station. Um, it's a pretty large area of uh, watershed, though it's actually um, one of the smaller watersheds of, of the San Diego region. Um, it's pretty polluted and it's pretty marvelous in places, but it's pretty neglected and abused. And, um, um, you know, it, it could use much better stewardship. So, I wanted to do a, a, a gateway that would hopefully sort of um, engender some stewardship by showing the kind of fascinating to me, the fascinating structure of this watershed, what these branch-like forms are, they're not tree designs. These are, this is a map of the, the um, drainage corridors, the riparian, areas and, and the canyons of, of a fascinating network of tributaries and streams that, that is what comprises Choice Creek. And so I wanted to basically represent the whole system and not just talk about this one restored area, but the whole system. And there's a little locator um, icon on that that locates you in, on that map. So you can Think of that as uh, by, by understanding it as a map, you can then connect yourself to other canyons um, conceptually and start to see underlying ecological connections between disparate areas of the city. And that way I would hope that people would kind of, uh, it would be the beginnings of maybe enhancing some stewardship and uh, respect for this watershed and that's what that piece is all about. Another gateway I recently made, though it wasn't really, um, is, I, we can call it a gateway. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's was the, the client here, not the client, but the sponsor was the um, Murals of La Jolla organization that, that um, gets business owners or private property owners to um, allow artists that they commission to uh, make murals on their buildings. And uh, I was invited to um, consider this two-sided sign surface on the top of a commercial building as a mural site and um, thought about a lot about the kind of history of roadside businesses such as this and this vernacular of signage that you know, the, the fin that sticks off the top of the building that advertises the, the, the built business housed within. Uh, that was, I wanted to kind of resurrect that in a way, but I'm not a sign maker. I'm not a muralist, really. I'm a sculptor is how I think of myself. I like to make things. And so I decided I would like to just make something and document that thing, photograph it, photograph my deed, and then use that as a kind of sign on this top of this building. So I, I thought this kind of mockery of the McDonald's arch was, was kind of amusing on this commercial context. Um, I chose a site, um, remote part of the East County, 
uh, a mountain top called Mount McGinty. So the mountain has the name McGinty, which like McDonald's starts with M. And uh, this mountain top has disturbed rocks because mining happened there. And um, you know, there's an, an old mining road. So there, I didn't feel like I was um, disturb, disrupting habitat by constructing this, this, this object that I call McCairn. And it's basically a short lived object, but the photograph would, would um, live long, longer and uh, basically advertise my deed in this business corridor in the Bird Rock neighborhood. And I think it has a pretty strong gateway presence there that I'm pretty happy with. And another piece that I think of being gateway-like, though not an arch, and you know, it's got a different kind of relationship to a journey than than it's not celebrating arrival, but your departure on the trails. And this is at the Mission Trails Regional Park out at a new ranger station in Santee. And so it's at a trailhead and um, Mission Trails is, uh, you know, for those of you who know it, it's, it's mountainous, it's chaparral, it's got a river running through it, the San Diego River. And I thought I'd celebrate these things, the water, the trails, the mountains uh, with a, a work there at the trailhead, and this is what I made. I, I, I call it Fountain Mountain. It's basically a boulder, and I think of the boulder as a mountain. And it, um, to get to the top of the mountain, I cut trails into the mountain, and they arrive at a summit where there's a, a drinking fountain. And this is how it works. I'll play this little video that I made while I, I, I was working on this piece in my front yard driveway um, on a trailer. Basically the water is captured by the trails and follows this meandering course down the slopes of the, the, the boulder or the mountain. And just it's just this serpentine course that it takes. And to me, that's fun. It's, it's like playing with cars as a kid. And there we are back at the summit. One of the things I think about is how often you see things like antennas and, and uh, um, water tanks on the tops of mountains. So a fountain on a mountain seemed to make sense. And the last piece of my integrated kind of uh, projects that I, I'll show you a recent thing. This was from the summer before last, the one, so a year ago last summer, I was the artist in residence at the Timken Museum of Art in, uh, in Balboa Park. It's a beautiful modernist um, building, free to the public that houses a really important old masters collection. And they invite artists to uh, be the artist in residence. The deal for the artist in residence is that you have to work on site in public view. And so you're kind of on display and they also want you to respond to a work in the pub, in the permanent collection. And so I, I looked at this uh, Fragonard piece, um, like from the 1700s, uh, Honor Fragonard, a French painter. He painted this, uh, this depiction of a kind of idyllic scene of, uh, called Blind Man's Buff. People are playing um, this game in a garden and uh, but what really caught my eye was this this tree and what, what caught my eye about is how instantly it reminded me of the Y adapter chandeliers that I I make using twin socket adapters like I showed you that earlier piece from the, the container in Copenhagen. So looking at Fragonard's tree I thought how it really reminded me of well, it, it, it really looked like it wasn't, um, wasn't painted by looking at a tree and, a, and copying what you see. It wasn't based on, on visual observation, but rather um, his understanding of how trees grow, bifurcation after bifurcation. He constructed this tree kind of like a schematic of a tree, 
just going bifurcation after bifurcation all the way out to smaller branches and, and then finally into the foliage. And that sort of way of um, building the tree on the, on the canvas um, interested me because I like to build in schematic modular ways. And, but also I liked his pictorial sensibility, the way he uses trees always to frame, to create these sort of vignettes of this, the scene where the action is. His trees are like um, framing devices. So I thought I would do an homage to Fragonard's trees and make, uh, build a tree myself kind of in a very constructed way um, and chose a material that was, would lend itself to being constructed with um, this is slotted angle iron and um, and perforated straps, basically erector set like stuff for adults. And um, this is how I construct I constructed this tree um, on site in this rotunda on these benches. Um, these benches, I'll tell you a bit about the benches because I kind of liked how many problems these benches solved. It, the benches solved three problems. Um, of working in the space. First of all, I needed a, a sturdy work surface for um, like mounting a vise and, and using a, a, a kind of shear for cutting the metal and my wrenches and all of these things. I wanted a place to sit and a place to work that was, you know, suitable for, for this kind of work. And, but I also needed a, a, a sturdy plinth to anchor the, this cantilevered tree on. Um, because I couldn't anchor it to the travertine floor, that, that material there is sacrosanct in, in that building. Uh, so this bench served as a plinth as well. And it also facilitated visiting with the, the um, museum visitors because I didn't feel like I is so, I thought that working in public on display seemed a little odd uncomfortable to me um, that I thought maybe the, it would be less uncomfortable if I was interacting with people and having conversations. So I, I thought of this um, solution as a way of um, letting people sit with me and visit while I constructed things rather than just staring at some exotic creature on display um, in his um, unnatural habitat. So uh, that was what the benches did, and ultimately they facilitated the, the title of this work is Electric Picnic, and it really kind of felt like an electric picnic at the opening. Everybody seemed so comfortable and um, kind of re refulgent in the, this, uh, the glow of this piece. And that's my, um, the end of my show. I do have a few more slides I could show, but this is in terms of the, the integrated work that I have. Um, I thought I'd end with this image and uh, we can get into the rest of the, the program this evening. Let me see how I back out of here now, put on my glasses. Hi, Michael. Hey, uh, welcome back. Um... All right, so thank you so much for your insight and taking the time to present to the new school community. Um, and we wanted to take some time now to have field some questions. Um, so just wanted to remind everyone that if you have any questions, um, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen there. And it looks like We've got some coming in. Um, all right. So we've got one here that I'll ask. It's, do you look at the impact your art has on the community? Um, why it is? Why is it that your work is interactive in a way, and and that it makes people think? Well, yes, I. I that's a great question. I I do. Uh, think about the impact and I hope to have an impact. I mean, that's, that's for example, that uh, gateway I showed you at Choyas Creek, like the hope that it, that, that design has some 
uh, influence in the stewardship of, of the ecology there, um, you know, or just uh, an impact that Rocco Park, my, the riparian might have, you know, basically the sense of arrival, the, the enhancement of that experience, uh, impact on communi communities can be so many things. Uh, if it's just, uh, if it's just uh, causing a passerby to have a smile for a fleeting instance, that's nice too. Great. Um, we have another one here. What, what's a project that you find um, most inspiring? Of my own or other other work? Of your own. My, my, my most inspiring work? <laughs> well, you know, I feel like I'm most proud of Rocco Park, the, the riparian. I feel like that is the work that best um, captures my ambition as, a, as an artist. It's been, it was like the largest, um, I mean, uh, everything I, that part or that, that work has about it is like, um, well, it's just, it's, it's the location, for example, super, super key, super central, super busy, gets a lot of vac, a lot of traffic, a lot of use, a lot of, you know, admiration. I see all the time people um, uh, that has videos that have circulated on social media and, you know, maybe skateboarders um, riding underneath there. Um, there's been so many events that have been held, you know, in that park and that works, um, serves as a backdrop to things, you know, so it's got a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, centrality and, um, uh, I feel like it really, I understood the site very well and under, and, and brought certain, I don't know, parts of my own way of thinking to that project. And I feel like I made a, a great contribution to the city with that work. All right, um, I've got another one. Um, it says, I love how your work is so explorative and natural. What advice do you have for students who aren't sure about getting out of their comfort zone and exploring the unknown? That's an interesting question. Um, exploring the unknown, you know, uh, that's something that, that keeps me, keeps me, um, you know, interested in life. I just want to want to go on adventures, be they in, you know, I've, I've been a restless artist. I haven't, I haven't kind of found a sort of thing that I just am content to make similar versions of again and again and again. And, and at the end of my career, you can say, look, it's a Roman de Salvo. It looks exactly like every other Roman de Salvo. Uh, that's not been my mode. I've been very restless in exploring different media of different things. But part of what I do is also responsive to, to context. And that's because contexts are always so different. It, it's, it's a bit of an adventure each time, maybe a lot of an adventure because, you know, uh, each context has a, a whole new realm of, of things to research and maybe um, an entirely new way of building something or a medium to that is the kind of logical um, response to that context. So uh, in terms of advice, I would say uh, if you're responsive to the context, it's going to be uh, an adventure. If, you, if you're going from place to place with your work, as an architect, presumably every, every house is a different setting, a different site and has different challenges. Um, it'll, uh, you know, there'll be some adventure with each project, I would hope. 
Great. Um, we've got one here. If you did not receive that call to help assist on the trolley station, do you think your career would have taken a different path? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, who knows? I, uh, you know, public art's been a really important part of my career. It's been really where I feel like my my calling. And it's interesting that I did, I kind of gave up on it in the beginning before really, like, um, you know, I. I don't know. It just is. I, I feel very fortunate that um, my career kind of unfolded in the way it did. I've had um, some, you know, success and notoriety in both the fine art, commercial gallery, and museum world, as well as in in the public arts uh, world. So uh, it's all kind of. You know, each 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 of these things feed each other in my work. You know, like like you've seen that uh, things that I do for public art, making a model ends up being a whole basis for making some studio work um, uh, later on, and vice versa. Things I experiments I do in the studio, I might find some application in a in a public project. Uh, this is all just sort of Part, part of the, the equation. All right, we have one. Um, if you could do a project over, would you? And if so, which one and why? Okay, I'll be honest. Probably, probably shouldn't be. I should probably say no, everything's been perfect. But, you know, um, that, 25th Street uh, is called Crab Carillon, the, the, the railing over 25th Street, the musical railing that I showed you, it doesn't very, it doesn't really sound so musical when you play it. And what happened with that project was that it was designed, the spacings between railings was based on the spacings, this architects will get this as a, as a kind of a problem um, that, Basically, I was matching the existing railing against the the, the freeway. Al the freeway bridge already had a railing on one side, and so I thought we'll we'll match the spacings of that railing, the the, the distances of seven inches between the stiles uh, or the pickets, and we'll just replicate that interval in the in the railing on the other side of the sidewalk. And so that that the music was composed for for basically a certain cadence. And uh, um, we had a song, we had a design, and then um, I was informed by the city that we couldn't build it that way because railings have to have, uh, there's this four inch sphere rule. You can't fit a, a sphere through that. It, it's like head entrapment problem. We don't wanna entrap a kid's head in a, in a railing. So, um, we had to close up. We couldn't. We couldn't recompose the song. We had to close up the railing, and it basically um, changed the whole approach to making it, it musical. You have to kind of avoid hitting the the, um, the the bear style. There's a chime style, then a bear style, and a chime style, and a bear style. And to strum it, you if you strum it, you get a bunch of racket. Um, so you can't strum it. You have to kind of attack each each note as you go. It's a harder thing to make sound good. It requires really a trained musician, <laughs> a percussionist to to get it to to sound decent. But also the whole thing is um, competing with freeway noise and all that. So from a from a musical standpoint, I I've thought of ways to to design it differently now in hindsight, knowing how things went. I would. I would gladly do some things differently in a if I had a do-over on that one. We have another one here. When creating a piece, what goes into your process? What do you think about? Um, do you consult with other artists or even the community? Well, sometimes consulting with the community is essentially a requirement of the job with public art. In fact, almost invariably, it is like it's um, 
it's stipulated contractually that you have to attend some community meetings and, and field community input. So I, I've, I've got a lot of experience in that. Um, uh, the, uh, yeah, there's, there's times when, I, when I'll mull things over with other artists, friends, or whether they're artists or not artists, also other designers and, and, and creative people. Uh, friends, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's, it's good to talk, to share, helps the process. All right, we have one here. Um, you call your work sculptural, yet there are nuances of type um, form of pavilions. The contemporary use of pavilions has been become has come to transcend both art and architecture to create space. Mm -hmm. Are your intentions to make or provoke use of space? Um, what language do you wish to translate towards a constant activation of space? Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel like that question is, um, not sure how to answer it. Uh, pavilions, yeah, they're, they're a thing. I, I realize that. Um, and how to activate space. I, I'm, I'm a real responder to space. I respond to, to interesting spaces. And uh, sometimes it's a pavilion. There's, but there's also things like follies that are sort of pseudo, pseudo spaces that are really more to things to be gazed upon, like a gazebo, um, and uh, those all all of these things interest me as a sculptor. So they're they're forms, uh, celebratory forms, but they're 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 uh, they're potential potential terrain for the sculptor, be they follies or gateways. Um, uh, I realize when I'm you know doing something like Rocco Park. I'm not an architect. I, in that project, I did did benefit from having a collaboration with the landscape architect and as well as the architect on the project, um, who uh, is um, uh, oh, I'm uh, you guys probably know know him, but I'm drawing drawing blank on his name. Anyway, uh, for example early sketches of my riparian concept were like these concrete um, columns that went up to this, this I-beam that supported um, the, the create, you know, the colonnades created um, this right angle that had these lintels that sit squarely on the, on top of the, these columns, but it was sort of ungainly and I didn't realize it until the, my architect collaborator let me know that it'd be nice to actually float that I-beam off the top of the concrete block column a little bit. It's just little touches like that. Um, an, architect, an architect's sensibility um, was helpful there. I'm, I know this doesn't really answer the question. The questions that I think is beyond that's, me, I'm afraid. But is that's it all right. Yeah. Um, I had one. Um, so it, earlier on, you mentioned a project you did earlier in your career um, using a shipping container. Yeah. Um, and then hanging a chandelier, which was one of your first uses there with the Y sockets, and then using the ornate carpet and the finish edge with the base molding mm -hmm. um, with a ridiculous amount of mitering. And I was wondering if you had any um, comments or thoughts on some of the um, current trends that we're seeing with shipping containers actually being used um, now. Um, whereas back, you made a comment on it through your art a while back. You know, even before I, uh, I had that experience with that shipping container in Copenhagen, um, when I was an, un an undergraduate up at the California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland, I, I uh, worked at a place, I was a mold maker for, um, for porcelain pedestal sinks. 
and uh, and my mold shop was actually in a shipping container. Oh, and it was not a very comfortable workspace. Um, so I I have like lived experience with shipping containers. They're they're useful and practical, but they're really temperamental with heat. Um, uh, that's I think the big issue. Um, one thing that I did see that I haven't seen much of that I really um, liked when I revisited recently my old mold shop in Berkeley, um, it was totally covered with vines, which I thought was such a perfect kind of um, uh, thermal solution to some of the problems without having to actually insulate, you know, uh, or build anything, doing any, doing anything construction wise to to do just growing vines over the thing. It was, it seemed really appealing to me. Um, well, yeah, containers are a thing. They're, they're uh, basically, they were a thing in Copenhagen too, but you know, uh, that, that exhibition architecture's concept was originally that artists in port cities could just go to their harbor and fill a shipping container with the artwork, the, their installation, and then put it on a boat and send it to Copenhagen. It turned out to be way more expensive to do that than to actually just bring the artists in person and have them work in Copenhagen and put them up at a hotel and all of that. So that's how it worked out. But the the glut of shipping containers in this country because of just the trade imbalance that we have internationally um, is what makes these things so ubiquitous and attractive, uh, I think, as uh, like, well, it's a cheap, but sturdy box. Let's let's uh, you know, let's build something with it. It's, it's uh, so it's it's um, the the kind of container craze is understandable when you understand the kind of economic context that makes them so so uh, plentiful and abundant. Great. Uh, we're gonna wrap up with one last question here. Um, and that would be any advice that you have for architecture students that also have an affinity to art or artwork? Hmm. Uh, well, um, so there's some great ones that you can look to for as uh, in, inspiring artist architects, you know, artists that are architects, for example, locally, Russell Forrester legendary artist and architect, uh, mid-century uh, San Diego guy. Um, uh, the, I think, um, you know, he had, he had a, an, an architecture career that was distinct from his art career, but both of them were really successful. There's, there's people like that to think about, but I also think that architecture can be an extremely creative profession, a real gratifying, outlet for one's creative instincts. Um, but I can I also see how it can be essentially um, a lot of just rigorous um, uncreative types of problem solve is problem solving that's sort of template based and dictated by budget and uh, well everything is, but you know, where there are certain constraints that end up governing so much that you're really not feeling like much of an artist when everything is dictated by code and and uh, and program and in in not very imaginative ways, uh, you just have to kind of like build 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 uh, filing cabinets for human activities. So wow. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a good quote to end on. Uh, so Roman, thank you again so much for your insight and taking the time to present to the new school community. Um, I know your work has been inspiring and um, will provide students with a renewed appreciation for how art interacts with our own work and design. Um, so if you had any last words, go for it. Um, other than that, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, New School of Architecture, and for this invitation, Michael. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. I wish I could have actually, this is actually the first time I've had a presentation where the audience was invisible. I, it's just, 
it's, it's, um, but I, I trust you're out there and I wish I could see your faces and say hi and thank you um, and, and get, kind of get some feedback from faces, but uh, it's, it's not that way this time. It'll, it'll happen someday, uh, another time perhaps. Thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully in the future we can uh, bring you on campus to see all those friendly smiling faces. I would love that. All right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. All right.